have time to mess with it. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. A couple things. Um, first, I'm sick, um, so I hope you all are not. But I'm going to be keeping a mask on today to prevent um, spreading anything, except when I'm up here and I'm not going to be in your face. Um, I've also got somebody who's going to help me with communion distribution. That way, I'm not right on top of you or touching anything that you're going to eat. Um, so hopefully, I will be over this by next week. But because of that, and because uh, I go into a coughing fit every time I try to sing, it is not COVID I tested at home. But because I do that, we're going to speak the liturgy today instead of singing the liturgy. Um, during the prelude, I'm going to go back there and continue to mess with the computer because we're having some kind of technical difficulty and it doesn't want to live stream us to the work today. Yay. But we will get it figured out. No big deal. Um, you heard a couple weeks ago that we had the refrigerator go down. Um, we have since looked at the refrigerator to see how old it is and it was purchased when we got everything from the kitchen back there so it is close on to 30 years old. It's given us all the service it's going to give us. Um, so at this point we're going to replace that fridge with a new fridge that will give us 30 plus years of new life. Um, and, and we will send that one on to the recyclers in the expected hope of the resurrection. Um, so we are thankful that we have the money in the building fund for that expense because of y'all's generosity. However, we also have discovered that we have a termite issue. And so if you would like to give towards ref the refrigerator to help offset that so we can be sure we have enough to deal with the termite issue, that would be appreciated if you're able to do that. The termite issue is not as bad as it could be. It's not Christ community, thank you. Um, we caught them early on, and so we're going to, we've got several bids to have that treated, and once we find the right one, it'll probably come before the congregation because it'll be more than council can spend, but we'll get that taken care of, and none of the people who've inspected it so far have seen any structural damage, so nothing to worry about. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got to say on that. So just keep praying, and this will be all right. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship and pray with you.
Please stand as you're able for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <coughs> Most merciful God, we, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and, and cannot free ourselves. ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it, and bring your saving love to fruition in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you're able to the reading of the gospel. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those eighteen who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Not long after COVID took hold, I decided to download an app I heard about called TikTok. I knew it was very popular with the teens that I'd led in youth ministry, so my decision to jump on there was meant to be more of a joke than anything else. They'd been very clear with me during my time with them that I, at only 32, was too old to be on their platform with them. So the very first thing I did was seek all of them out and like all of their videos. You know, just to have some fun. But after I had my fun, I was surprised to find that I kept using the app. Considering it started as a joke, I never expected that I'd come to like it. After all, depending on who you ask, TikTok is either an app where young people do strange things, or is a dedicated propaganda tool of the Chinese government to steal your data and brainwash you into believing in communism. Well, I can assure you that I've neither taken to dancing nor felt a sudden desire to give all of my assets over to the government, much to the disappointment of the IRS, I'm sure. As for my data, China is welcome to have it. The intelligence analysts assigned to me will be bored to pieces. I found that I continue to use TikTok mainly because I'm fascinated by the real voices, the real people that I hear in those video clips. People get on there and they just are who they are in a way that they're not in the rest of the world. TikTok has vast amounts of video content that fall into a variety of categories. And like Facebook, the videos you see are influenced by an algorithm that looks at other videos you've liked in the past and suggests new ones for you. But you can trip that up by looking and searching for different topics. I also, I mean, oh, I got it. as much as I love watching funny videos to share with Rosie before we go to bed at night, I've also found really interesting content on there on history, on food, which I clearly like, on woodworking, and even on the church. 
Unfortunately, I found that the church videos cut both ways. For every video I watch made by a pastor around my age talking about God's love, there's at least two of someone detailing the ways that bad theology, bad church teaching hurt them, or that is teaching bad theology in and of itself. At first, I hoped that I could reach out to those people who were hurting and those people who were going off into the wrong direction. But I learned quickly that many of them who were hurt were so done with religion that they wanted nothing to do with anybody who looked like a pastor. And the ones who were going off in the wrong direction didn't really want my help. It cuts deeper than that. There are videos out there detailing everything from churches that teach girls from a young age that they're only made by God to get married, raise children, and be silent in church. There are stories of people being thrown out of their church communities because they dare to love, think, or even vote differently than people. No wonder the church is struggling. For those people, the church wasn't a refuge. It was a place of hurt that completely changed the way they saw their God. To them, God became not the loving creator of the world, but somebody who was out to get them, or maybe even somebody who didn't exist at all. I've never felt quite so helpless as a pastor in my entire ministry. Bad theology is a major problem, and it has been since the very beginning of time. The Bible is witness to this, because the word was given to us to try and push back against the bad theology that we were coming up with. Whether it was the idols that the people in the desert turned to in their time of trouble, or the false preachers that we meet in the New Testament, bad theology is like having an anthill in your yard that you hit with a lawnmower. Pretty soon, you're going to have little anthills everywhere. Just look at our readings this morning. Bad theology shows up among the Israelites exiled in Babylon. People who were so busy making up new rules to avoid another exile that they forgot to listen to God. It shows up in Corinth, where people were convinced that Jesus was all they needed. So any of that stuff, that business that happened before Jesus, well, you can just get rid of that. Didn't matter what God did in the beginning, right? And beyond a shadow of a doubt, it shows up in our gospel lesson this morning. We hear there that Jesus was teaching in front of a crowd, as he often did. And while he was doing that, some people came up and asked him to weigh in on a recent tragedy that had happened. Apparently, while they were worshiping in the temple, the holiest place in Israel, some Galileans had been executed in the temple on Pilate's orders. That would have been a terrible crime. And regardless of their words, the people were really asking Jesus to weigh in, not on whether that was okay or what he thought, but on whether those people had died because of God's judgment. That was the prevailing bad theology of the day, after all. If you were suddenly struck down, whether it was in the temple or while building a tower in Siloam or just riding around on your donkey, then obviously you had angered God somehow and he struck you down. I mean, basically God was just waiting behind a bush, waiting for you to put a toe out of line so he could jump out and smite you. As ridiculous as that sounds, and it should sound ridiculous, I wish I could say that the church had moved past such bad theology, but that would be a lie. The sad truth is that it's still a huge problem in the world. Each Christian denomination seems to spend a lot of its time weaponizing scripture against people and telling them that if they don't believe exactly the way we say to believe in every way, shape, and form, that they're going to suffer for all of eternity. Fortunately, heaven's not going to just be us good Lutherans, y'all. There's going to be a lot of us up there. Bad theology has been used to justify everything from slavery to segregation to discrimination of people we don't agree with. It permeates our lives, where we have somehow become comfortable with the idea 
of coming to church and proclaiming love for our neighbors and then going back into the world and supporting politicians and political ideas that hurt those very same neighbors. It even finds its way into our final moments in life. When I was a hospital chaplain, I once spent three hours in a hospital room with the man who was dying, desperately trying to convince him that death wasn't God's judgment on him for his bad faith decisions in his life. The only solace that I have out of that situation is that after he died, still not believing me, he at least got to see the truth for himself, and I can believe that he is at peace. This isn't the message that Jesus wanted taught. If anything, this idea that God is the big bad wolf out to get us for all of our mistakes is the idea that Job's friends proposed. Job's answer to them was the same as Jesus' answer. God doesn't make bad things happen. And it certainly isn't punishment for something small that we did. When bad things happen, God is the closest to those who are suffering, trying desperately to offer them help. Remember that as soon as Jesus was asked about these recent disasters, he knew what was being claimed and he pushed back against it. Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will perish just as they did. There's no bad theology there. There's no threat. Jesus made it clear that those poor people hadn't suffered because they were any worse than anyone else. Death came for everyone eventually. <clears throat> the only difference between the crowds and those who had died that they brought up was the crowd was still alive and able to continue the process of repentance after they saw Jesus go to the cross and conquer the death that they so feared. Unlike what might be taught in other places, Jesus didn't threaten people with burning in hell. Who'd want to serve a God who claimed to love his creation but was perfectly okay with tossing half of them into the lake of fire? That's not a theology of love. That's a theology of fear. And it empties that cross of its meaning. Instead, what Jesus did was help people understand that through a parable, God did care for them and gave them more chances than they ever deserved. He was a fig tree, a symbol of the great nation of Israel, who despite having been planted with all the possible advantages, had yet to bear real fruit. But when his continued existence was questioned, Jesus the gardener stepped in on its behalf, offering to help it and guide it so that they could begin to bear fruit. So that the people could continue their journey of repentance. So that we could continue our journey of repentance. This is the most important thing that we hear this morning. We as Christians aren't called to bad theology or theologies of fear because fear only causes more hurt. If we want the good news of salvation in Christ Jesus to go throughout this world, we have to focus on spreading Christ's love first through ourselves. Our God isn't waiting for us to make a mistake so he can smite us. He's a God who through Jesus gave us a leader to nurture us and help us turn aside from the sin that held us back. He's a God who lowered himself when he didn't have to, took the form of one of his own creation, suffered death on a cross, and then defeated the hold of death for all time to come just to give us a shot at a better life. That's love. God isn't the boogeyman. God's the loving creator of all we are and all we will be. 
Sisters and brothers, the word for repent in Greek means more than just to change your mind. It literally means to turn aside, to change everything about yourself, drop everything away, and align yourself with everything that God is. God is love. Scripture tells us that. Which means that we, too, are called to be and share love. Not just inside these beautiful four walls. Not just when we're standing in front of other church people who might know if we get out of bounds. But when we're out in the world, surrounded by all the evil and hurt that it can possibly throw at the goodness we have to offer. As Jesus' parable promised, each time the landowner has been disappointed by our lack of, of fruit, Jesus has taken charge of nurturing us to change that outcome. He nurtures us now. His grace has sustained us and made it possible for us to step outside of the fear we're supposed to have and begin to bear fruit by advocating for justice and care and equity for all, by facing challenges together as a faith community that we could not face on our own. And we've had 2,000 years of time to learn more and more about this repentance and how to walk that path. By living into that and sharing the truth of our loving God, we will no longer waste productive soil, but we will bear fruit through Christ's cross-given gift of repentance and forgiveness. May we strive each day towards that goal of being better, secure the knowledge that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. invite you to stand as you're able if you sing our hymn today.
Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Thank you. 
grace and life. Bless us and these your gifts, which we receive from your bounty. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and our grace. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the to the fullness of your grace. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <clears throat>
Please stand as you're able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. this morning, so I'm recording the service to be sent out later. It's kind of emblematic of a larger problem we have. Um, over the last couple of years, we've done a lot more new things online and with technology and stuff, and that's great because it means we're advancing as the church advances and we're staying current. And that's a good thing. But it also means that a lot of the technology stuff has fallen on me. Um, and while that Whatever the problem is, it's probably something I could figure out if I had time, right before the service isn't time. Okay? Um, and this also happened on Ash Wednesday, and I managed to get it straight before the service started, but it, it just puts everything in a tailspin. So if one of you wonderful people out there knows somebody who knows something about technology, and I'm sure we can scrape up some money somewhere, and would like to come help us on Sunday mornings run this, so Pastor Josh doesn't have an aneurysm, <laughs> it would be greatly appreciated if you send them my way to talk. LaCroix. <clears throat> <laughs> um, just, it doesn't have to be somebody who's like a, a, a computer science major. Just somebody who knows how to run a computer and I can teach them the rest, okay? But please help me out so I can. We don't have any more problems. Go in peace. Jesus meets you along the way. Thanks be to God.